Hello, just before we get started with this video, a bit of context. Uh, the following video is about the Swarthmore Lecture and Britain Yearly Meeting as a whole of 2022. However, I'm aware that it's now 2023. I filmed this video just before I moved house, just before I um, started my new job and all that commotion, but just didn't have the time to really edit it and get it ready, which I now have had. So without further ado, let's go back in time to past me and let's get started with this episode. Hello and welcome to this episode of Quake It Up. In this episode, I want to be looking at Britain Yearly Meeting, in particular, the Swarthmore Lecture. Uh, what it is and how it went and some thoughts about it as well. So what is Britain Yearly Meeting, apart from precisely what it says? Sometimes Quakerism is really handy and the words and vocabulary we use is very helpful and sometimes less so. This is an opportunity where it is actually very helpful. Britain Yearly Meeting is a yearly meeting in Britain, where basically every year, all the Quakers come together, normally in London, every four years it's somewhere else in the UK, and um, this is where loads of meetings are held on varying topics. There's normally a theme for what the uh, yearly meeting is looking to discern, and basically the culmination of um, work with area meetings and local meetings comes together there as well. Uh, so quite a lot of big decisions can be made at yearly meeting. For example, in recent times, uh, the decision to uh, allow gay marriage within Quakerism was one that happened, well, probably about a decade ago now. And so uh, this was something where uh, everyone comes together to discuss and to uh, discern these things. Uh, Britain Yearly Meeting 2022 was obviously going to be the first one where um, we were allowed to meet in person. The last couple of years it's obviously been online, um, but with the pandemic well, changing, shall we say, uh, they were able to do it both virtually and in person. And I was going to go and I was going to take my camera and I was going to go and show you what it was like and interview people and things like that. But oh, goodness me, I was so exhausted from the last couple of weeks of work that I just, by the, by the Friday before the weekend of it, I was in no state to really go and uh, do that. So I went to the, a lot of the sessions online instead. But anyway, I'm going to march on. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, because, well, mainly because I really want to talk about the Swarthmore Lecture because the Swarthmore Lecture this year was phenomenal. It was amazing. I, I've got nothing but the highest praise for it. So this is what I want to talk about. The Swarthmore Lecture is um, the keynote speech of Yearly Meeting. So it would be a um, a Quaker who discusses um, effectively their research or uses it as an opportunity to talk about Quaker theology from their perspective. The Swarthmore Lecture is named after Swarthmore Hall, spelt differently, confusingly, One, and I always get them wrong. One is spelt O-R-E, and I think that's the name of the Swarthmore Lecture, whereas um, Swarthmore Hall, uh, which is where the name comes from, is double O-R at the end. And Swarthmore Hall was the home of um, Margaret Fell, married to George Fox um, after her first husband died. And that was really the hub of early Quakerism before it all went down to London. And um, that's why it's called the Swarthmore Lecture. And that's been going on, I think, ooh, maybe exactly 100 years. I don't know, near, near enough 100 years. Um, it was started in uh, the early 20th century. Uh, and has been going on yearly ever since then. And it generally covers Quaker theology, though other things have come up as well. And so the, the Swarthmore Lecture is has been delivered by some of the most, it's not just general Quakers, these are some of the most important and influential Quaker, Quakers of the time. So for example, Rufus Jones uh, has done it i think i think it's the only person who's delivered it twice but you know we've got uh, william charles braithwaite has also delivered it uh joshua roundtree edward grubb has delivered it um uh, more recently ben pink dandelion has done it so uh, a lot of very high profile quakers have been delivering these and so this year in 2022 it was delivered by helen ennis who is a professor at the university of glasgow um, she works in child and adolescent psychiatry. 
Not that she was talking about that, though. She was talking about race instead. Uh, the name of the lecture is called Perceiving the Temperature of the Water. And I'll put a link below to the uh, YouTube video with, with the lecture on it so you can watch it yourself. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't know of Helen Minnis before I, uh, before I saw this lecture, so I didn't really know what I was going into. I knew it was going to be because I'd read some of the material beforehand. I knew it was going to be discussing race both in Quaker, Quakerism, but also in uh, the world of science. Um, but I didn't know much anything more than that. And I was absolutely blown away by the, and I think the, the, the people who were there in person as well really were blown away as well. The main reason why I know that is because the, um, the Swarthmore lecture is mainly seen as a, a, a style of vocal ministry. So it is treated as if it were a Quaker meeting for worship. So for example, uh, instead of being introduced, uh, the clerk who's leading the, the 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 lecture would ask the everyone to centre down into silence, and then when the speaker is ready, they then can start. They can start, and so it is vocal ministry. So therefore, because it is ministry, no questions are really given, nor are you necessarily meant to interact so such as applause or whoop or yell or scream or whatever it is meant to be completely in silence but um it was it was very surprising halfway through she started singing it was brilliant and in the at, when she's finished everyone was like blown away and clapping and stuff so it was really not what we were expecting so what she meant by testing the temperature of the water basically came from a quote that she heard where um, an older fish was talking to two younger fish and the older fish, obviously with more experience, says to the younger fish, um, oh, how are you finding the temperature of the water today? And the two younger fish turn around and say, what's water? Effectively saying that uh, when encountering racism, people who are who have never They've never had to live with that at all. Don't know, even know what it is. They're completely blind to it. Um, and so how on earth can they even know how to fight against it or to uh, improve it or um, uphold people who have suffered from it if they don't even know what it is? And so that is sort of how she dealt with her whole lecture was basically on how can we, as modern Quakers, and, you know, we have to say it, she is she is black but the majority of quakers are white how do we as white british quakers deal with the effects of racism which quakers have been a part of and i think this has been a big thing that is coming more and more to the fore in, in british quakerism taking responsibility for our part in racism i think the traditional view is that Quakers were the good guys. They were the ones that were early abolitionists and um, helped with the um, Underground Railway and things like that, Wh which is true. Um, but also there have been coming to light more and more examples of where Quakers either let the slave trade happen or did actually genuinely benefit from it. Uh, I think over the last year, uh, there was a there was a room in a friend's house, which is Quaker HQ in London, which was the William Penn room. Uh, William Penn, a great theologian, early Quaker, and I, I don't want to take anything away from him intellectually and his um, experience and his uh, what he brought to the movement. But he did own an estate with slaves on it, and so they changed his name. They changed the name of the room. And so it's things like that, which Quakers are slowly trying to change, change the narrative on that. It's not just to be, oh, we were the good guys, but that we were, that we are responsible as well. Even not just for what, how Quakers benefited from the slave trade, but also just the inherent fact that white people in society, in, Brit in uh, modern British society have an advantage over, um, uh, over people of other skin tones. So she's mentioned the idea of being that we should be equal, that we should be looked to be as a society equal in diversity rather than equal being all the same. 
and she said that our brains are hardwired in a way to try and make um uh, black and white distinctions not necessarily black and white in terms of skin color but as in right or wrong yes no decisions and that when we stereotype in that way we are more likely to stereotype negatively with something which is against our us versus them mentality so it, for example if i see someone who is who looks different to me or is in a that is different socially to me i am more likely to stereotype them negatively than if they were the same as me so how do we overcome that so she comes up effectively with two main um advices for us really as to how can we overcome this so the first thing that she talks about is creating a strong networks nationally internationally to try and overcome racism to um, ally with um, those people who are unfairly um, uh, prejudiced in society and looking to support them and do our best as a society to um, be an open place where these people are welcomed and treated as equal in diversity as as possible the the second thing is that and this is something that is then taken up in at the end of the early meeting in the epistle is the idea that we should look to make some form of reparations and how can we as a, a society how can we look to do that how can we as a society make reparations for the wrongs that the slave trade and racism has caused to modern british society and i think i don't think we've quite understood yet how how we're going to do that I, I, i'm assuming that might in some way be financial and i can imagine and i think this is sort of what um Helmenes was talking about maybe using our uh our privilege in order to help fund uh those who have been less fortunate less fortunate through no fault of their own but just through um, systematic racism so for example setting up uh, bursaries setting up um, uh, charities or um, uh, funds to help get people to university get people into um, help people out when they're starting um, their adult life and things like that or help families um, just so that we are doing something to right that wrong and putting our own effort into it or giving us giving of ourselves something to help um to help stop uh what we have benefited from and so this is a new idea and and, and i'm i'm quite taken by it i think it is you know understanding that yes this is something that happened you know with the slave trade at least this and slavery this happened hundreds of years ago but the effects are still there and it's all very well and good saying oh yes but quakers were really good and you know lots of us worked for um emancipation and things like that but at the same time we still live in a society where this is uh, many wrongs have are still linger today and we can't say yes well that was awful but now it's fine it's still not fine and we've got to recognize that and we can't change the past we can't pay uh money back to people who were exploited hundreds of years ago but we can do something about the situation which we have benefited from right now and i think that was just really powerful to hear uh, amongst other friends who recognize the same thing they recognize that there's something that we should be doing and giving it a name and giving it a sort of structure though i think it does need to be developed i mean i am looking for sort of leadership on that as to how we can do that but i think it's something that i would very much like to be part of to try and make quakerism and make hopefully britain um a more equal place and also to recognize one the privilege that we have unjustly got as speaking for myself as a white as a white person but also using that positively in order to bring up uh, those who have on the other end of the spectrum been um unjustly uh, negatively affected by by this culture that's that's developed so i always find these i always i always listen to the swarthmore lectures because i think they they do give a good um 
a litmus test of where the society is going and what's important in the society. Last year, it was a lot about um, accepting um, and doing more to accept uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community and uh, and they put and things put in place for that. Whereas this year it has been more about uh, developing um, and really emphasizing how we are going to be an anti-racist church. What are we going to do to make sure that we are always looking to be a force for good in society for everyone in society and not just those that have, as I said, unjustly benefited from a system which has been going on for too long. So I would really recommend that you do give um, uh, uh, give a listen if you haven't already to Helen Minnis's, um Swarthmore lecture. It is fascinating. She can say she said everything in a much better way than I ha in, than I can. She's got a really lovely voice as well. It really is really nice to listen to as well as being really thought provoking what she's saying. Um, so I don't know if if you want to leave comments as to what how you thought of the. Uh, what you thought of the Swarthmore lecture this year um, and maybe also if you have any ideas of how you think that these this idea of reparations can take shape I'd be really interested to know your views on that as well. Thank you very much for watching this video if you liked it please do click on the thumbs up button and do check out some of my other videos about Quakerism in the UK if you want to keep up to date with the latest videos please do remember to subscribe as well it really helps thank you